local amendments and intergovernmental affairs committee. And uh, first thing we'd like to do is for uh, Madam Secretary, if you could please call the roll. Representative Branscombe. Here. Representative Decker. Present. Representative Gooch. Here. Representative Heron. Here. Representative Hodgson. Here. Representative Imes. Here. Representative Cook. Here. Representative Derek Lewis. Here. Representative Scott Lewis. Here. Representative Moser. Representative Raymond. Here. Representative Swan. Here. Representative Weber. Present. Representative Bratcher. Representative Callaway. Next, are there any members that would like to recognize any guests that are in our presence today? All right, before we begin uh, discussing our agenda items, I guess it's probably easily seen that Chairman Bratcher is not here, so uh, we wish him well. He has had a, a family emergency and ask that we keep them uh, in, in our prayers, and so if you would do that for him, that would be greatly appreciated, but we do miss him today, but we'd like to welcome everybody to the first meeting. I would like to welcome our new committee members uh, Representatives Branscombe, Representative Decker, Representative Hodgson, Representative Raymond, and Representative Swan. So we'd like to welcome all of you all to the committee as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, if I may, I think there's also another introduction that's in order, and uh, we would like to welcome you as a new member and as also as our vice chair on behalf of the committee. So we uh, look forward to working with you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll go ahead and move forward with the first item on the agenda today. It's an overview and update from the Secretary of State's uh, office on the November election. So if y'all could come forward uh, to the testimony table, make sure that you introduce yourselves for the record and uh, make sure that your microphones are turned on and you can proceed. Thank you. Hi there. Michael Adams, Secretary of State, and this is my Deputy Secretary, Jennifer Scutchfield. Members of the committee, good afternoon and welcome back. I would be proud to serve anywhere as the Secretary of State, but after all we've achieved in raising Kentucky's profile as innovators in election administration over the past three years, I'm especially proud to serve as Kentucky's Chief Election Official. Before I begin in earnest, let me say thank you not just for our major election reform legislation in 2021, for which our Commonwealth continues to draw praise from across the country and from our own citizens. But thank you also for continuing that trend of improving our voting process. In 2022, you voted in bipartisan fashion and nearly unanimously for a budget that fully funds our elections, for a further expansion of voter access and for a further tightening of election security. Kentucky is the only state in America that is simultaneously making it easier to vote and harder to cheat. The subject of this hearing is an overview of the 2022 general election. By all means, we should assess that. And I'll give you my take. But as the purpose of this review is to inform potential legislation, I hope they'll permit me to focus on the future. I understand the sentiment this session is not to enact many major policy reforms, but rather to return to the focus originally intended for odd year sessions, tweaks to existing legislation. I totally agree with that as, as applied to our elections. There has been a lot of change very fast in our voting process over the last three years. That change has been good but additional large-scale reforms of our election system would not just confuse our voters, they would limit our ability to learn from previous elections and make improvements based on that knowledge. And of course, they would cost a lot of money in your first non-budget session since 2019. There are modest things that we can do though that can have a significant impact. To reiterate my interim testimony in November, let's acknowledge that early voting works. At my urging, you acted in bipartisan fashion to enact it, and over a quarter million voters took advantage of it in our general election. 
I'll note that the turnout for early voting correlated pretty closely with the partisan affiliation of our voters. Republicans with a little less than 50 percent, then Democrats close behind, then independents. In other words, early voting is not a partisan issue. There is no Republican or Democratic way to vote. Early voting doesn't favor a side. It just helps the voters. It doesn't just help the voters who vote early. It also helps the voters who don't. The counties that had long lines on Tuesday, November 8th, would have had even longer lines had their voters not already had three days to vote. Although I'm proud of early voting, the solution to long lines on election day is not to add more voting days, at least not in a non-presidential election year. More than four times as many voters voted on Tuesday, November 8th, as voted in the three early voting days combined. The lesson here is that in order to reduce lines, we need more voting locations not more voting days. That is not to say that I did not try in this past election to secure more voting locations, even though I lacked the legal authority to compel it. I did place calls to and visit county clerks and request that they open more voting locations. Sometimes they were cooperative. Sometimes they were not. I also had my senior staff, in particular my elections director, Heather Quinn, conduct a review of all 120 county election plans. Unfortunately, the Board of Elections expressed impatience with our review, questioned our authority to conduct it, overruled my objections, and approved every single county plan. I think if there is any one thing my term of office has proved, it's that you get better decisions made when you're inclusive. I believe my office has value to add here. And to the extent that power exists to, consolid to approve consolidation of voting locations, that power should be shared with one or more offices that are accountable to the voters. There are a few ways to accomplish an increase in the number of voting locations. One would be to do what we did in 2020 via emergency powers that you granted. We gave the counties flexibility to consolidate voting locations, but they had to get the approval of the governor and me. I think it's important that someone politically accountable, whether it's the governor, me, both of us, or some other statewide constitutional officer, review and approve a local election plan that reduces voting locations. An alternative approach to fixing this problem would be to develop a statutory formula to set a floor for how many voting locations a county needs for early voting and election day. I don't know offhand what that formula should be. It might need to be different in one county than another because some counties' voters use early voting more than other counties' voters. It's complicated, but I think it's doable. I'm neutral over which approach you prefer, but we must do something to prevent long lines in the future. Finally, we should incentivize the counties to open more voting locations when they apply for funds appropriated for their elections. Let me give you an example. Shortly after the election, Carroll County was given a grant of $2,805 based on a formula of $255 per precinct for their 11 precincts. However, in that election, Carroll County only offered one voting location. Boyle County was compensated for 25 locations but opened six. Hardin County was compensated for 59 locations but opened 10. If a county opens one voting location, it shouldn't be compensated as though it had opened 11. And you should consider either directing eligibility for funds be tied to the polls being opened, or you should at least alter any funding formula to award funds to counties based on voter population rather than the number of precincts. Indeed, Otherwise, you create a perverse incentive for counties to create more precincts than they should have and then to close them. There's a second way we can improve the voting experience. Close the loophole that allows electioneering at the polls during early voting. KRS 117.235 provides, quote, no person shall electioneer at the polling place on the day of any election or within a distance of 100 feet of any entrance to a building in which voting is conducted if that entrance is unlocked and is used by the voters on any primary or election day. 
The statute also provides, quote, no person shall electioneer within any building designated by the County Board of Elections and approved by the State Board of Elections for in-person absentee voting during the hours in-person absentee voting is being conducted in the building. So we've prohibited electioneering at the polls on the six days of excused in-person absentee voting and on election day, but not on the three days in the middle, the no excuse early voting days. Some clever candidates took advantage of this in the past election and voters complained. Applying this prohibition universally should be an easy fix. And third, we need to improve the recount process in two ways. Our recount law is fairly new. It was presented last year by Speaker Osborne and Leader Jenkins. We worked together in bipartisan fashion to develop a clear and workable process. They did not foresee that the process would be misused by bad faith actors who seek to create unwarranted doubt in the integrity of our elections. Ironically, this measure became law in the same bill that closed the loophole that had allowed bad faith actors to demand a recanvass, even if they lost by a landslide. We should close the same loophole on recounts, which are far more taxing on our election officials than recanvasses. We have a separate law that permits an election challenge upon an allegation of fraud, corruption, or even administrative error. And any person with evidence of same will not lose the right to contest an election. But the frivolous lawsuits by people who lack evidence of fraud, corruption, or administrative error and lose by a wide margin must be stopped. I won't sugarcoat it. Recount abuse contributed to the high attrition we saw last year in county clerk's offices. Additionally, you should provide clear standards in the recount law. For example, we recently saw a recount in the state house election in a district that covered two counties. One county promptly performed a hand recount. Ultimately, so did the other, but for a time it appeared they would conduct only a machine recount. We should not have different standards that apply in different counties in the same election. Whichever approach you prefer, you should make it universal. Although none of these changes is major, they are all important. I am well aware that this is an election year <laughs> and the temptation is to do little and to leave the election rules alone. I would submit that an election year, especially one in which we expect close outcomes in major races is exactly the time to make these modest but crucial improvements to the process. Thank you all very much. All righty, thank you. Appreciate the update. And I just think I had a couple people that had questions. Just want to make sure if anybody, I had uh, one question I wanted to ask if we have any other committee members. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Representative Dick. Thank you both for being here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, today. Uh, I, of course, sponsored, well, not of course, but I sponsored the bill in 2021 that uh, did the major overhaul. One of the things that we talked a lot about then and we approved, it something that you and the governor had started, which was the voting centers. Um, I'm beginning to doubt that as having been a good move, and I've had a lot of complaints about it from various uh, people, constituents of mine, uh, various lawmakers who had problems in their counties it, during their elections. And so I'm wondering if it's, uh, it was a good idea. Uh, you talk about having someone politically accountable who approves the plans, but do you uh, believe that, still believe that the voting centers are a good solution to help more people vote? Because the problems I've heard of are that they actually suppressed voting in that, especially in counties where there weren't a sufficient number, people waited and waited and left. Uh, the other thing I've heard complained about is that if there is a recount, by hand, the ballots are all interwoven. So they're in a machine so you have to go out and, and separate them and so I'm wondering if one of two solutions might work one is getting rid of them altogether going back to precincts where people can vote close to where they live of course if it's early voting you'd have to have poll workers during those times 
going back all together, getting rid of them, or having them only on the early absentee, no excuse days. So I wondered if you could share your thoughts about all that. Sure. Thank you for the question. So when I proposed vote centers, uh, initially the idea wasn't to have uh, less convenience for voting, obviously. It was to have more convenience. I've been in politics for 30 years between being a volunteer, uh, being an attorney, and doing this. And the number one way I've seen voters suppressed from voting is they show up at the wrong place to vote. And normal people don't know their precinct. People like us do because we love this stuff, but normal people don't keep up with that stuff. At most, they vote once every four years. They don't remember their precinct, and sometimes they change. And so if you insist on people having just one place that they can go vote, that suppresses voters. The idea behind the vote centers is that voters will have options. That's what elections are about is choices. We've given them more days to vote. We've given them more places to vote. That's good. What I am concerned about is that the vote centers are becoming a crutch and that we are over consolidating the locations uh, because it, the incentives are there for the county to, to save money. And obviously, we want the counties to be held harmless here. Uh, my concern is that we are reliant, not we, but uh, at the local level, there's too much reliance on the vote center model and too few places to vote. Uh, I think for some counties, the vote centers don't make any sense at all, and they shouldn't have to do them. And by the way, they don't have to do them. It's discretionary. In Harlan County, in Harlan County, you don't have a county seat with a large population concentrated there and then suburbs, et cetera. You've got mountains all over the place. You've got people that have trouble getting from one place in the county to the other. For Harlan County, they need their precincts open. Uh, for a place like, say, Warren uh, or Fayette or Jefferson, larger counties that have a, a different sort of population, different dispersal of their population, it might make a lot more sense to have vote centers and put them on commuting paths for their workers. Uh, the whole point of this is that the bill allowed for local decision making. And I think that's good up to a point, but I do think that the incentives are there where at the local level, in a few counties, not most, in a few counties there's been an over-reliance on the vote center model to get rid of voting options. And so that's why I'm proposing uh, that you all consider one of various different fixes or maybe more than one, but I, I don't advocate getting rid of all the vote centers. And, and what, I'm sorry. Just yes, to clarify, just to clarify, what about only during early absentee voting? That would not be a, something you would want either if they, you're saying if they had a correct number. Is that right? I don't know that we had problems with access during the early voting. To, to my knowledge, no one's reported to us that they didn't have enough locations for early voting. No, but what about not having it on election day? Well, you know, again, I, I think having voter choice of where to go vote is a good thing. In theory, you can have all the precincts open and make them all vote centers. Some counties have done that. Uh, most, most counties do not. They have a few, I'm uh, using that term loosely, a few vote centers relative to their population and then a number of precincts open. Uh, my view is there's no one right way to do it. And so I think you have, again, some choices. You can say, we're gonna have a floor that's gonna be set by statute based on your voter population, make it a formula, or you can have some sort of uh, backstop where there's gotta be an additional layer of approval before they consolidate uh, to that level. And I'm neutral on, on what you choose, but I think we have to do something about it. Would you indulge me one more quick question? Yes, ma'am, oh, one you. more. Thank what about how would you resolve the recount issue where they're all in the same con container? so to speak, and, and then causing a problem with the recount? Well, to, to my knowledge, that's not any different from the way it's been done previously because the ballots, once, they, once the election's over, they leave the precinct and they're all delivered to the county seat. So to my knowledge, we've, we've got no complaints uh, from any kind that's on a recount about that being problematic. You may hear differently from others that testify today, and I'll defer to them on that, but we've not heard any issues from that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Raymond. Yes, thank you. Hello, Mr. Secretary. I'm new to the committee. Can you help me understand your role and influence on the State Board of Elections and how it has operated 
in years past when the Secretary of State was the chair of the State Board of Elections. And then um, from 2019 to 2022, the, the General Assembly had removed the Secretary of State as the chair of State Board of Elections and then reinstalled that position there. So will you tell me sort of how it's operated differently in, that, in those phases and, and what it means for voters? Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you a, a brief uh, history uh, and Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone who's here, if I misstate anything, but I believe in 1990, the legislature uh, voted to make the Secretary of State the chair of the State Board of Elections. Uh, there had been a State Board uh, prior to that time, and of course, uh, in statute and our Constitution, there are certain election responsibilities that my office has, but it wasn't until, I believe, 1990 that that was uh, codified in, in statute uh, from, uh, well, I, I can't speak to what happened when I was 14 years old in terms of how the board functioned, uh, but uh, to my knowledge, uh, the uh, operation of the board from, let's say, 1990 to roughly 2019 was that uh, the chair of the board essentially uh, made the policy decisions, was the agency head. Uh, certainly the board would meet and ratify those, uh, those decisions. That's certainly the experience that I had when I was on the board under uh, my predecessor's uh, term of office, I was on the state board, uh, and that's that's how it operated at the time. Uh, I think uh, the sense of the legislature in 2019 was that there was too much power in the secretary's office and too little independent authority on the, on the part of the board. Uh, there was uh, some dispute about whether the board had approved certain contracts and, and so forth, and so the legislature voted to uh, essentially remove the secretary from from chairing the board and really from much of a role on it at all, uh, remove the ability to even vote uh, on the board. And so what you then saw was, this is my own personal uh, take, uh, a very uncomfortable period uh, of, of disputes, sometimes loud ones, uh, sometimes caught on camera uh, between the secretary and her staff and the, and the board and their staff. Uh, it wasn't a good look, I think, for anybody. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we had uh, through uh, when I was sworn in here in, in 2020, uh, I've certainly made it a point to not have that sort of uh, tension uh, with, with the staff of the board. Uh, I think I've avoided that uh, successfully. Uh, now we're in sort of a middle area where, uh, per legislation last year, which passed in bipartisan fashion, the Secretary of State was reappointed as the, as the chair of the board, but I still don't have any authority uh, over the staff. I don't have any uh, authority over really much of anything, uh, I can't even vote on it. So I think maybe we haven't fully corrected for where we uh, went in, in 2019. We're kind of in a limbo area. Thank you. If there are no more questions, Representative Namus. Got a question, Mr. Secretary. I want to thank you for the work that you've done. One in particular on behalf of the people of Odom County, thank you for objecting to the plan or trying to get the plan uh, that was actually went into effect for the November election this past November. Uh, you objected to it. You asked for the State Board of Elections to object to it. They did not, unfortunately. Uh, the Speaker and I requested your office to object to the plan and for the State Board of Elections to do so because it didn't work in the primary, and we knew there was going to be a lot more people voting. And I think what we saw was an absolute abomination. Um, at a 5.50, I've showed the video at a previous com committee. Um, be happy to show it again. Uh, at South Odom Middle School, the lines were around the front of the building, side of the building, all the way to the back, people in wheelchairs, people on canes. Thank God it wasn't snowing or raining. It was an absolute abomination. You talk about suppression of the vote. Well, there were votes suppressed because I was standing there. Um, obviously, it was a, a it was so bad the judge had to say anybody in the parking lot you couldn't couldn't get a parking space either. Obviously, they went down to five locations, sixty thousand people in Oldham County. Um, so I want to thank you for the, on behalf of the people of Odom County for standing up for those folks to help, help them have more access. I want to make sure I'm not interested in pointing fingers or, or blaming anyone. I'll I'm interested in just telling it straight and telling the truth. I also represent Shelby County and Jefferson County, which back to the, went back to the precincts. There were lines nowhere like in Odom, and they were also lines inside. So those, those elections went forward splendidly. So I want to congratulate you and congratulate the county clerks in those areas. Um, I guess my question is, what can we do? You, on September the 9th, presented to the State Board of Elections, and you were going to go through each, each county's plan, saying the good ones are the ones that you wanted to approve, 
and the ones that you wanted to disprove. And Mr. Johnson, who I don't know, is on the Board of Elections. He said, are you going to go through them all? You said, I plan to for the benefit of the public. And he says, I'm on vacation. I've only got an hour. We need to hustle up. But hopefully we can get them done. Um, that, to me, is a problem, especially in looking backwards when I know what, occur- what occurred. You again on September the 20th in another meeting tried to uh, push forward some objections and uh, were cut off by the chairman, I think, of the board. And um, and they went through and just straight out whole hog approved all of the plans, not even doing it seems like seems like and they'll be up in a minute. I want them to prove to tell me if I'm wrong, said to the staff. Have you guys went through these staff said yes. And they said, well, I'm, I move that we approve them all. I don't know that the people that have been appointed went through each of these things. I kind of hope they didn't, because if they did, they really missed a couple of them in a way that was is really unacceptable. And I want to just highlight two things, because I think it's important that we hear this. The locations that we were chosen that were chosen in Odom County, one of them was South Odom High School, South Odom Middle School, not sufficient parking. So people were, were parking on the other side of Veterans Memorial to my people from my friends from Louisville. Veterans Memorial is like Dixie Highway. Very heavy traffic, wide, wide road. People were crossing Veterans Memorial. Praise God, none of them got hit. They then had to go down a ditch, not a small ditch, down a ditch, cross it and up a ditch. Twice I got in the ditch to help old men get out of the ditch, to walk, to go vote, to stand in line for over an hour. Um, so I, I, don't, I, don't under, I, I don't know why. And I brought this up a number of times. And I know there are other things that are that are problems or that or there are issues. Uh, I know the ballots were long this time. I feel I believe there were new new papers, and so those things contribute to the mix, no doubt about it. But when the Speaker of the House and another person who represents the area says this didn't work in the primary, and then it's approved, hurry up! I only got an hour on my vacation, or look in the staff. Did you guys do your due diligence? I find that troubling. My question is this. What can we do to make, and I'm going to ask this to the State Board of Elections also, what can we do so I can go to the people of Pee Wee Valley, many of whom, as I saw I was standing there, came up there, said I'm not voting in that, told me this. One of them, I was on the phone, thankfully, with the Office of the Attorney General, and I put him on speakerphone. And, he, and this gentleman said, I came here to vote. It's 530 or so, but I can't stand in that line and left. And you could see the cars are driving up and going right back out the line. What can we do to make sure that never happens again so I can look at the guy who lives in Pee Wee Valley and in Crestwood and say, you've been heard, it won't happen again. What can the General Assembly do to, make, to, to ensure that it never occurs again? Well, I think you have a few options, and they're not necessarily uh, contradictory. You can do all of them if you choose. Uh, one is to have uh, an additional backstop, as we did in, in uh, the general election in 2020. Uh, if, if you would remember, Representative Nemus, uh, you – uh, brought a lawsuit uh, against uh, against election officials in the spring of 2020 because uh, all the plans for consolidation at the at the county level had been approved without any any uh, pushback or veto, uh, and we learned from that experience. And in November of 2020, uh, the governor and I were given authority to reject plans that weren't adequate, and and we used that power. We used it in Jefferson to compel more locations. We used it in Fayette to compel. Uh, more locations. I don't recall what all the counties were, but but it worked. I do think having a, a, a backstop by someone that has to face the voters is, is beneficial. Uh, alternatively to that, you could come up, and I can help certainly, uh, come up with a formula that says if you have X number of voters, you need X number of locations, and just have a floor in the statute that would prevent that over-consolidation. And then uh, another option is to tie funding to opening the polls. Uh, I don't think any county should be getting funding for 11 precincts and then opening just one. Thank you. I want to note, I joined Keisha Dorsey, who is a Democrat councilwoman on that lawsuit, as well as some citizens. So it wasn't just me, but they, they stood up as well. I really hope that you and the State Board of Elections work with our chairman to get this done. I think we need it done right now. We've got important elections this year and then the presidential election next year. Um, and, and my people in Oldham County, are they're pretty angry about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Namus. Representative Hodson. Yes, Secretary Adams, a uh, question going back to something we discussed a minute ago regarding the statutory recount provisions. If you have a county that has a multi-precinct voting center and you have to do a hand recount, how do you reconcile 
uh, let's say the <clears throat> precincts are, are, are split depending on the race, how do you reconcile the voter check-ins where they get their ballot to the ballots cast at the end when you've got all precincts layered in the box sealed together? Seems like you would have to go through a process of manually separating the ballots first, and I'm not sure how you reconcile the check-ins from the uh, from the iPad system that you scan in well, on. I'll, I'll let anyone speak to this who knows more about it than I do. I don't conduct the recounts. I don't have any, any role in the process. Okay. But uh, pursuant to uh, Rep Representative Decker's legislation in 2021, our overall election reform model, uh, we allowed these uh, vote centers, but only if the county had the capacity to separate out the voter by precinct, to, to come up with election returns by precinct, voter by precinct. In other words, they were all, they were all just – uh, combined together so uh, the technology uh, allows for that so so we're not just throwing them all in a box where they're not connected to each other we do have a record of which voters in which precinct and, and therefore which votes were cast in which race unless i observed incorrectly i think we literally are throwing them all in a box together and sealing them in the box so if you, uh, jefferson county for instance in the early voting days i received a printed ballot and i could put it in any scanner so that would be people from potentially 600 different precincts with ballots mingled together in the box and specifically concerned about a large county like jefferson or fayette having to go through a recount process uh, would you have to literally separate by hand every single ballot in in, Je in jefferson county from the early vote in order to do that eyeball recount i i don't think so but i'll defer to the fayette county clerk that just did a, a recount and did it pretty quickly without a great deal of expense i believe were they able to reconcile the voter check-in records to the ballots cast? They are, sir. the The ballots are not connected to the to the e poll books. The, I'm, I'm the check-in, but they are reconciled at the end of the voting. Um, the number of ballots cast is checked against how many um, persons have signed into the electronic poll books. So there's a reconciliation between the number of ballots cast and check-ins at the precinct level. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate you, Secretary Adams, y'all coming to present today. We're going to move on. I think several people have somewhere to be uh, at 1.30, so we would like to uh, continue uh, forward with an update from the State Board of Elections on the November election. So if y'all could come forward to the desk and please make sure that you introduce yourselves and to the microphone and then proceed with your presentation. Good afternoon. Karen Sellers with the State Board of Elections Executive Director. Afternoon. Taylor Brown, General Counsel. Good afternoon. Richard House, Assistant Director. With us as well behind me is Ben Chandler, Woodford County uh, member of the State Board of Elections. Deanna Brangers, Jefferson County member of the State Board of Elections is also just behind me and available. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. We would like to thank this committee for the opportunity to come before you today. We've been asked to provide an overview of the November election. Given the challenges of staffing and recruitment of poll workers, 120 counties and their clerks conducted a successful election. SBE wants to recognize this dedication that each one of these counties has toward uh, the integrity of elections in the Commonwealth. We understand and recognize the concerns of lines in the counties. Lines are not attributable, attributable to only counties that had vote centers. Counties that opened all precincts also experienced lines in some locations. The number of judicial, federal, state, county, city races, and every word of two constitutional amendments that were created and on the ballot, quite possibly it was the longest ballot that the Commonwealth has ever experienced. Uh, additionally, the last 12 months leading up to the November election, SBE was working with their counties to upgrade their election voting equipment to meet the newly required voter verified paper audit standard. 
To date, SBE has helped 113 counties meet the January 1, 2024 deadline to ensure that all voting equipment is has a voter verified paper trail and in compliant in those areas. In those counties, all voters now cast their ballots on paper. That was 113 counties this election. So on top of the ballot being historically long, many voters were casting their new paper ballot on new election equipment for the very first time. Despite this, to SBE's knowledge, there were no defeated candidates from the general election who had grounds to file a post-election contest action. However, the trend of defeated candidates requesting recounts that first emerged after the primary did continue following the general, and this is exposing the need for legislative action. With that said, these recounts have in each case also served to show that the state's new voting systems are accurate and dependable. Lastly, I want to thank the counties for embracing the state's new election night reporting system created by SBE. Unlike other states, SBE's reporting system is not owned or hosted by a foreign entity, but is a domestic system maintained securely here in the Commonwealth by the State Board of Elections. This was the first election cycle in 2022 of the rollout of our new ENR system, which was a very complex technical, technological operation, and we anticipate that the system will be even more user-friendly in 2023. We also welcome discussion on certain statutory changes that can also continue to enhance our election reporting process. And to sum up, the November 2022 general election encompassed a lot of extensive electoral changes enacted by the General Assembly from the session in 2021 and in 2022. So we would like to thank the county election officers who worked all these voting locations, the county board of elections throughout the state, all 120 counties, the Office of the Secretary of State, and this General Assembly for implementing all of these new measures, demonstrating that the Commonwealth of Kentucky once again remains a recognized leader in election administration. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Representative Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to I'm going to uh, direct my question to the members of the Board of Elections. Um, welcome. I've I've known Ben Chandler and his family for a very long time, and Deanna for for quite a while, long length of time as well. So. I've been voting for 37 years. I've, I've never missed an election, a primary or a general election. I've always uh, voted. This past uh, November election, uh, when I went to vote in my home county, we had uh, three voting centers uh, for a county of 83,000 residents or 64,000 total voters. Uh, three voting centers uh, for early voting. And then on Election Day, November 8th, we had three voting centers plus two individualized centers, one for the west end of the county. That, that's a little difficult to make it uh, the drive into uh, the other regional centers. And then we had one in the south end of the county, so a total of five on Election Day. When I went to vote... Uh, in 37 years of voting, I've never I've never experienced this, but I have I have voted early, and I have voted on election day in both uh, since we've been doing that. <clears throat> it took me so when I pulled up into the parking lot at the of of uh, Paraquette Springs in Shepherdsville, uh, I had trouble finding a parking spot. I would estimate 
there were probably three to four hundred people already in line when it came time for me to vote. Uh, and, and so I just took a quick look at my watch to see the time that I parked and, and walked uh, to get in line. By the time I finished voting and was leaving that polling place and heading back to my car, it had been an hour and 40 minutes that I had that I stood in line. Now, as Representative Nemus says, I, I was thankful that the weather was good that day. If it had been raining or snowing, I would have still stood in line. I would not have miss the opportunity to vote but there's a lot of people who may not want to do that or may not have the hour and 40 minutes to stand in line to vote um now everybody seemed to be in pretty good mood that day uh i did hear over and over and over again from folks that they will always continue to vote on election day they will not participate in early voting, and I don't begrudge anybody that wants to do that. I've, I, I personally like voting on Election Day. It's just it's, it's been exciting, and I've enjoyed participating in that. My question is, we had a county of 64,000 registered voters. We had 25,000 individuals vote in the November 2022 election. <coughs> That's a 39.4% voter turnout. I will tell you in 2023 and 2024, we are going to have a much higher voter turnout. I know 2024 will be much higher. Um, when the plans are submitted to the Board of Elections, for your approval or disapproval and, and and I don't know what the secretary recommended for Bullitt County. I don't know if he was if he was satisfied with that plan or not. My question is moving forward, will will you all take into consideration events that happened in November 2022 in in my home county when looking at the next elections plans that are submitted because quite honestly I agree with Representative Decker. I hear from a lot of constituents who really want us to go back to the individual precincts where we vote voted our precincts. And and I hear all the time, folks, you know, that early voting is is helpful for some, but they want to go back to that election day voting and they and specifically they want their individual precincts back. And so my question to you is how are you all going to move forward in judging these plans and looking at them, taking into account examples that I've provided for you today? Are you aware? Were you aware of the situation uh, in my community? And, and I know election officials dealt with the best situation that they had, and they wanted to uh, – I, I know our county clerk has told me that they have trouble finding folks to work on election day and early voting. So – I guess I'll, I'll leave it open at that and like to ask you for your uh, your comments on that. Okay, thank you, Representative Weber. Uh, I'd like to, to try to address that. Uh, first of all, I was not aware of the situation in Bullitt County, and I don't remember Bullitt being one of the counties, I'm just looking here at my notes, that was actually pulled out for a second review. Um, so I think everybody was in agreement to approve Bullitt counties, probably based upon the success of the election in Bullitt County in the primary. Because if we felt everything had gone well in the primary, we, we reevaluated everything. If there were problems in some counties, there were clerks that we asked to add another location or maybe look at shifting locations. We, you know, our staff, it wasn't the board members specifically, but I think the staff will tell you I was on the phone with them quite a bit asking questions because anyone who knows me knows I ask a lot of questions um, so no we were not aware of the situation in Bullitt County but we would absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt take everything that you said to us today and want any information that is available as we go forward to make any further decisions on this I mean I, I agree with you I think a lot of people do want to vote on election day I was one of those people that I like to go vote on election day there's something kind of almost like a holiday about it for me because I enjoy going to vote on election day. I've also voted by absentee and I've voted early. I like them all. 
because I like the opportunity to go vote. So, and I think, I think we have a lot of our public, I know my husband in particular, he likes the early voting because of the nature of his business. He doesn't always have control of the schedule sometimes with the way things come up. So early voting, being able to go over the weekend um, is helpful to him. So, um, and, it, and it worked out at about the same percentage that I think we thought it would work out. Um, so I don't know, I, mean, I think we have to take all of the evidence that we have. We had a lot of factors here. It kind of became a perfect storm. I wish that it hadn't in a few areas. Um, worked very well in other areas. So I think we've got to go back. We've got to review what what worked really well, maybe what didn't work as well, and make sure that we we don't ever have those kind of lines again. I mean, we have had lines in the in the past. I have stood in line even in Taylor County, uh, which is not a really large county, but I have voted and stood in line to vote there. So there have been instances where there have been lines in the past, but we don't ever want that to be the case. We want people to be able to go in not spend an hour and a half, hour 40 minutes, two hours in line, not have to go through a ditch to get over to the voting location. That, those are things that we need to know. I can say that as a board member, I was unaware of a problem with the primary in Oldham County. That was never brought to me. It was never raised. When it was um, brought up on September 7th, the secretary wanted additional time to review those plans, and I think the board is always going to honor the secretary's request to review those plans. I mean, we're not not going to not give him that time. So um, we gave him that time. It came back on September 20th, and at that time, I think we all felt like we were at a drop dead date over printing of ballots, et cetera, because of what the, the companies tell us they have to print the ballots, and I think we felt like we, we had to proceed at that point because anything else was going to to cause problems in just the administration of the election. So hindsight being 2020, we can all always look back and think we, we would like to do something different um, going forward. We're absolutely going to do something different because we're going to have those discussions, whether it's a formula that, that you all approve. I have no problem with that. Just think it's it's got to be a broad conversation of election officials between the clerks, the board, the secretary of state, so we make sure we get it right. Representative Weber. I, I would encourage you, uh, as you're looking at the plans in the future that are submitted, uh, to, and, and you may already require this, when a, when a location is submitted, do you ask for parking information? Is, does that have to be provided? Because I'll tell you, East Side Middle School, which was for the, for the Mount Washington area in Bullitt County, I was getting calls from folks who said, there's no place to park. And it's off of Highway 44, and you're not going to pull off on the side of the road. If I was out in the country, I grew up in Woodford County. Ben and I have known each other for a long time. There are places in there I would park on the side of the road. I'm not going to on Highway 44. But there just wasn't ample parking. And all three of the major center locations, I heard from individuals all day. I mean, they were parking in the grass, and they were they were creating their own parking places in order for folks to get in there to vote so I, i'm just i'm raising these as red flags for right. the future these are things we need to be aware of and we need to be prepared for parking can become a a real situation we can think you got the, the parking right but when you start having the longer lines like i said i think we had a little bit of a perfect storm here obviously people are taking longer fills up the parking lots, it becomes overflowing, then parking then becomes a problem. Parking's always something that uh, I know the clerks look at specifically when they're developing these. It's not perfect. Finding locations for voting centers and precincts sometimes, it is, you can, please feel free to, to talk to your local clerks. That also has become increasingly more difficult as is finding poll workers. So there's, there's just a lot of things that have to be taken into consideration um, and parking is always, always looked at, but I'm not saying we can't do a better job at it, too. We have a few more questions here, uh, running out of time before we have to be out of here. Uh, so we'll move forward if uh, Representative Branscombe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Ben, Deanna. Thank you all for being here today as well. Um, got a quick question here, and this is actually probably not directed at you guys. What is the status of the uh, risk limit auditing? Yes. 
I'm going to, okay, I'm going to defer to Richard on this. He's been instrumental in that process. Uh, right. Currently, as you know, Fayette County was one of our, one of our pilot program uh, counties. So it's in the, they're actually recounting ballots today. Uh, we are looking at around, we had hoped to do it in December. Of course, we told you, told everyone at that time it would depend on any uh, litigation or any recounts. We're looking around uh, January 18th or 19th to conduct that. We'll be following up with our clerks this week, and then we'll have a follow-up meeting next week to prepare for it. But uh, uh, January 18th or 19th looks like the deadline or the date we're going to do that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Representative Hodson. Yes. Uh, we knew in January, I guess, that this was going to be an extraordinarily long ballot for 2022, probably certainly the longest one I've seen in my lifetime. Is that is the length of the ballot and then the corresponding voter fill-out time, is that in your formula anywhere for evaluating the voting centers? You, you know how many voters you've got. You know the geography of the county. You know uh, about what your expected turnout is. But does the length of the ballot even figure into those, those equations? And, and do we have a mathematical equation to – to figure out an expected voter service time. You know, I would just use an example of everybody probably goes to Chick-fil-A once in a while. They've got an extraordinary number of people coming through there, but they zip right through that line because they they know how fast they want to service their customers. So I, I can address that a little bit. I, my background is I worked for the Davis County Clerk's Office for 26 years and did elections. So elections are never perfect. There you try to make the best plans possible and you try to prepare for everything. and and that's, that's just the view that we take. Sometimes it doesn't go that way, and how you respond and react to that and how you learn from that is a big big portion of that. Of course, it doesn't help at the time except for how you address the solution at the moment. Uh, as far as a formula, technically, um, formulas for vote centers that we learned from 2020, and I think I've addressed this before, in a vote center that has 10 check-in stations, with at least 60 poll booths, you could vote people. We voted about 4,200 4, people in the 12-hour day. Of course, that was a ballot that came in. People voted. Then they could, a lot of times, straight party or whatever they wanted to do, and they were out the door. This ballot, for instance, we looked at Jefferson's ballot, had 40 judicial races on it. Uh, they had the, the length of the, the amendment. So it took a little bit longer, and also, because of the amount of candidates, I think, that were on the ballot, we saw something that we hadn't dealt with before, and that is people using cell phones to actually look up candidate information there at the voting booth. So uh, there is a time limit on removing people from the voting booth, but of course, nobody wants to enforce that. I mean, you want to give people time, adequate time to do to the vote. So that was that, so as far as actually being a formula to get down to that uh, no but i will tell you that today uh, clerks sb staff we are thinking a little bit differently than we were pri uh, prior to this election so i'm sure there there are going to be clerks that are going to learn from this experience and move forward in a different manner all right thank you representative nemus thank you two things one thing um with respect to the machines being reliable i think they are i want to quick quickly report i represented the property value uh, value administrator in clark county she won the race by 10 votes on election day they recounted that she ended up winning by eight but it's not as simple as that it wasn't just two votes changed it was actually 12 she lost seven and picked up five the lawyers we fought over another 20 or so ballots so these machines are not perfect and it's not because of the machine it's because of the the way they fill them in but if there are thousands and thousands of precincts throughout the state so you know it, what I'm going to advise my clients in the future is if there's a couple votes per precinct that you're in, you should you should get a recount and challenge it immediately. So I I, I want to say they're reliable, but they're not perfect. I mean, that was uh, that was eye opening to me. We count we counted by hand. I didn't. But the, the court appointed count vote counters by and they, they counted all 14000 of those ballots by hand. Uh, so I got to see all the all the problems in first hand and, and fight for my client and she ended up winning uh, by t eight votes even on election day it was ten. So here's one issue that I have. I want to be really clear about this because my, my concern is that you're not taking it seriously. When we talk about Odom and Bullet counties, the response is there's been lines at other places. Louisville had forty three judges on the ballot. There weren't lines in Louisville. There were, but nothing nothing out of the ordinary. And I know the long ballot. I get I get all that. But when I hear, when, when Representative Weber says what was going on in Bullitt County, 
And I know what happened in Oldham County because I was standing there. I, I showed the video. You guys have seen it. I've been standing outside polling locations since 2006. It was no, it has never been anywhere like this. So I want to just be clear when y'all respond, oh, we've all been in lines. It's different in kind. I've never been in a line that's been wrapped around an entire building and you ought not to be required to do that. So I want to hear just straight up. You guys understand that those lines were longer in locations that had fewer voting locations than somewhere like Shelby, which went back to the precincts. You, do, you, do you acknowledge that? Or do you think the lines at all those locations were the same? Uh, thank you. No, I do not think the lines were all the same. And yes, there were lines across the state. And I didn't mean to assume that precincts had longer lines than vote centers. I couldn't speak for each county on how, li how long each line was at each location they have. But I can assure you, and I think it was something maybe Representative Weber said, as we look forward to the plans coming up in 2023, all of this will be taken into consideration. Between Richard, Taylor, and myself, and including members of our state board, they called some of the clerks. We spoke to every clerk and encouraged, you know, we looked at the geographic area, you know, tried to ensure that the areas were covered, uh, whether it was Bullitt or Oldham or Shelby, Jefferson, um, any, you know, any county, Russell, um, and tried to, you know, look at the population around a rural county and how far they had to travel. And I think that the majority of the clerks would tell you they spoke to either Richard or myself because we were looking at what was the best for the voters and the, the shortest amount of distance. Um, the To speak to Representative Hodgson too, um, you know, one of the things to look at in the future, I'm sure this isn't the last ballot that we'll have constitutional amendments on. And maybe in the future, you know, I recognize the language had to be what it was on the ballot. So that would also be a consideration when, you know, when you pick a vote center or pick whether you're doing all precincts is will we know what the ballot's going to say and how long it's going to be? And would we assume that the voter would need more time to vote and in which case you might need to increase your area of voting or your locations. Do you, do you know how many, reviewing Shelby and Jefferson's plan was easy. They went back to precincts. Do you know how many counties didn't go back to, effectively go back to precincts and had voting centers? Uh, like Bullet and Odoms, Bullets and Odoms. Was it half, 20? Just a guess. I would say maybe close to 70. Went back to? Vote centers, vote I'm centers. sorry. Okay. I, most of them, I think, actually went to vote centers. Some of them had combined. I think there was, you know, a speaking to some counties had vote centers, but then in some areas where the geographics required more travel, they might have had four precincts in one location as opposed to opening all four precincts individually. So the last thing I'll say is this. When you go, when you guys review plans, I know Odom County and everybody else is going to be submitting plans. I understand Odom's going to be submitting a plan for eight. That's not enough either. Not enough. Okay. Um, certainly not for general election. Um, please keep in mind, when there's a question, is this enough or is it not, err on the side of not enough. Because our people are entitled to easy voting. It's our job as government officials to kind of make it easy for them and and what we did was an abomination thank you mr chairman all right we're going to we're going to move forward i have a representative decker very quickly uh we do have a few more minutes before we have to be over there for those of you uh that need to move on uh we do have eight or ten minutes here before we uh, have to be there so i have a representative decker go ahead and ask her question thank you, thank you mr chairman um I, I do appreciate all of you who work in the election process in Kentucky. I know that you have all dedicated your professional careers to election integrity and increasing our voting turnout, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I do notice that the people who go around our state and um, speak poorly of our election system and raise questions and cause 
uh, voters to be concerned don't appear at our our elections meetings and express their concerns. They don't ask questions. They just do that where there is no response or public KET is not covering with the ability to respond. I have become concerned, though, uh, in the last few meetings I've attended where there have been representatives from the board, the staff, and Secretary of State's office, I feel tension that I've not felt before when uh, Representative Branscombe, Representative Tipton, and I worked for a year on House Bill 574. I didn't feel that. Uh, and we worked very closely, and I saw a great deal of cooperation between the State Board and the Secretary of State. I'm glad we are not having videos of screaming between the Secretary of State. I think it is better than it has been in the past. I do think, though, that it may not be ideal now as it has been. I think the relationships seem to have deteriorated. And I'm wondering if that doesn't hurt our voting process. When uh, I hear that there were lists made and uh, recommendations by the Secretary of State that weren't followed. I'm wondering if, if it is now uh, become so tense that that the, all of you are not working together as well as you have in the past, and I'm worried about that because I did hear today. I've learned a lot today, but I did hear that perhaps it took the Secretary of State longer than you felt he should have taken to do the review, but it, it distresses me to hear that he had a list that was completely not, none of it taken uh, into consideration. So I do urge you, please, to work on your relationships. Uh, I don't think I'm uh, wrong about this. I, th I think I have felt tension that I just didn't feel in the past, and so I encourage you, please, to work through those things because I think the voters of the state rely on us all to work together. And so um, I'm going to follow up later. We're out of time, but I do want to hear more about, and I think if somebody said maybe somebody from Lexington was here today, I'm still confused about, I understand that there are still precinct uh, accountabilities. We can tell who voted uh, and how many votes were cast and all that, but I am concerned about this conglomeration of the votes. I appreciate learning that that's always true when the precincts come together, but is there, I guess I'm looking for, is there a solution to if we have vote centers or even afterwards, is there a, a, some way to keep the physical ballots segregated? It seems like maybe impossible, but I can't, I, I don't wanna just assume that because I think the recounts are made harder and I would like to hear from Lexington how hard it was. But um, my overall thought is I encourage you to work through whatever is causing tension um, and I think we'll all be better off for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. We appreciate all of you coming to present today. We do know that the subject we've discussed is the foundational freedom for everything that we do here. So it's very important. It deserves a conversation and the utmost attention. Our next order of business is adjournment. Do I have a motion? motion. We are adjourned. <laughs>